Autism's history is short, but riddled with controversies, misconceptions and theoretical changes in how it is perceived. Autism began as a rare perceived symptom of schizophrenia in children in the 1940s and has evolved into our current understanding of it as a lifelong, more common, neurological condition, gaining its own diagnostic category in the 1980s. Large changes in our understanding of autism have occurred in a relatively short amount of time, leading to multiple theories and older, outdated information circulating at the same time as the more up-to-date research. Autism is also described as a spectrum, with a hugely diverse set of individuals within this diagnostic category. This variety has led to the adage, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Because of these factors, it is clear to see how misinformation regarding autism spreads and sticks. Here are a few common myths about autism. 1. Autism is a disease. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder and not a disease. Autism is present from birth and biological in nature. It was not caused by a virus, bacteria or environmental factors such as bad parenting. There is no cure for autism. In fact, the majority of the autistic community accept autism as part of who they are and would not like a cure, instead wishing for research and funding to focus on support, dealing with issues such as employability, suicide rates, anxiety, co-occurring conditions, plus developing therapeutic interventions and increasing awareness in the general public. Many autistic individuals now prefer the use of identity-first language, naming themselves as an autistic individual as opposed to person-first language which would refer to them as a person with autism. The argument for using the phrase person with autism is that above all else, someone is a person, a human being, so you put the person first. However, when you say a person with something, that something usually has a negative connotation, which identity-first language seeks to remove. You'd say a person with cancer, a person with dementia, because that is something external to their identity. But you would never say a person with blackness or a person with gayness. I mean, I hope you wouldn't. It seems within the community the majority of autistic individuals prefer identity-first language. They see their autism as integral to who they are, and they know their people. They don't need reminding of that, because autism does not take away from being a person. I guess you can see which side of the argument I'm on. Despite the autistic community positively embracing its identity in the recent decades, the focus of many research grants still remains on biology, genetics and risk factors, with funding attributed to causes and cures rather than support and services. This is one of the many reasons why a large proportion of autistic individuals do not like the organisation Autism Speaks. Autism Speaks refer to autism with a very negative narrative, spreading a fear of autism in their advertising rather than an understanding in order to raise money. Speaking of money, Autism Speaks' non-profit tax exemption form in 2018 revealed that only 1% of their budget goes towards family service grants. Only recently as well, in 2016, Autism Speaks removed the word cure from their mission statement. A lot of autistic individuals say that Autism Speaks doesn't speak for them. 2. Autism therapy should focus on being normal. A commonly used therapy for autism was applied behavioural analysis, which is still in use today. Applied behavioural analysis was developed by Ole Ivar Lovas in the 60s. Inspired by the behavioural methodologies of psychologist B.F. Skinner, Lovas applied the principles of reward and punishment to autism. Autistic children underwent as much as 40 hours a week of intensive behavioural therapy, the goal being to make the child, in Lovas's words, indistinguishable from their non-autistic peers. Children received positive reinforcement for socially acceptable behaviours such as hugging and eye contact and were discouraged from typically autistic behaviours using negative reinforcement. Lovas's work was praised as a better alternative to institutionalisation and his 1973 research and other studies since then have demonstrated gains in emotional, intellectual, social and educational skills for autistic children to varying levels of success. ABA is still used and recommended frequently but remains a controversial topic for the following reasons. 1. It is argued that ABA practices have changed over the course of autism's history, but there are still places where inhumane practices are being used in the name of negative reinforcement to create behavioural change. In only March of this year, the FDA banned electrical stimulation devices from being used on autistic students at the Judge Rottenberg Centre in Massachusetts. The establishment is currently appealing this ban. 2. Even if ABA was solely positive reinforcement, the underlying message is a negative one. Who you are is not right. This is similar to the message underlying gay conversion therapy, which Lovas was also substantially involved in. This message also does not reflect the current thinking of the majority of the autistic community, which preaches autism understanding and acceptance, leading many to question if ABA still has a place in today's world. 3. 
It is suggested ABA does not create actual change, but instead simply teaches masking, which has been shown to have detrimental long-term effects on the mental health and well-being of autistic adults. Many autistic adults have linked their ABA experiences to trauma and developing PTSD. 4. ABA practices work to stop any behaviours not seen as normal, not just those which are self-injurious or harming. This includes stimming, aka self-stimulating behaviours. Most stims are not harmful, but instead are coping mechanisms developed to help with information processing and emotional regulation. Lovas claimed his therapy was successful, but the definition of success becomes incredibly subjective when it is only based on encouraging behaviours which meet the social demands of a non-autistic population, especially when these in themselves are subjective. In the end, the heart of every therapy should be to aid in everyday functioning and to foster a child's independence and autonomy, celebrating who they are, not what they should be. 3. Autism is just in childhood. Autism is a difference in neurobiology present from birth. Autistic traits are spotted around the two to three year old developmental mark and characteristics may change in a person during key stages of development such as puberty, but it is a lifelong condition. Autistic adults have previously been overlooked in research because of the myth that autism is only present in childhood. The majority of autistic adults have developed coping mechanisms in order to deal with the anxieties created by everyday life, one of which is masking causing extreme mental health difficulties as they are unable to access the support they need. Regardless of how a person's autistic characteristics may present themselves, a person is always autistic. 4. Autism is male only. The ratio of autistic men to women has dramatically shifted over the course of autism's history. For a while, autism was seen as a male-specific condition. Ratios of autistic men to autistic women have changed significantly over time, but whatever the numbers are, it's always been more men than women. Due to this, participants in research were autistic men, diagnostic criteria was based on autistic men, and diagnostic tools were designed to find autistic men. Autism theories such as the extreme male brain theory developed by Professor Baron Cohen, suggesting autistic individuals have a more male, systemizing brain, add to this male-focused bias, although this theory is not without critique. It also doesn't help that autistic characters in the media, such as Sheldon in The Big Bang Theory, Raymond Babbitt in Rain Man, Christopher, in The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, and many others, gives the general public a harmfully reduced, stereotypical idea of what autism looks like. Because of all this, professionals are more likely to consider autism as a diagnosis for men. It has been suggested boys and men may just have a higher prevalence of autism due to genetics and increased hormones such as testosterone. By contrast, the female protective effect theory suggests that women are somehow biologically shielded from autism and need more genetic mutations to display autistic traits. This by itself, though, cannot explain the male-to-female discrepancy. Women are frequently misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. It is suggested autistic women display different and less noticeable characteristics of autism in comparison to their male counterparts. These behaviours are also, due to societal pressures, hidden using a coping mechanism of masking. Masking is used to hide autistic behaviours in favour of most socially acceptable ones in order to meet perceived social demands and expectations. Sociocultural factors such as gender-related expectations therefore influence the evaluation of symptom severity and diagnostic predictions. Women are frequently not seen as autistic enough to push themselves over the arguably higher autism threshold needed for diagnosis. Because of restricted media representation of what autism looks like, misconceptions around autism have remained, with the general public having a reduced impression of autistic individuals. A lack of diverse, appropriate autism representation could lead to the reinforcement of untrue, harmful stereotypes, such as that all autistic individuals, such as Raymond Babbitt in the film Rain Man, have a savant, special skill. In fact, under 30% of autistic individuals have special talents, and these are not necessarily mathematical in nature. Speaking of media representation, it is interesting to note a current discussion in the autistic community around the film Music, directed by the singer-songwriter Sia, which is to be aired in 2021. In this film, a non-autistic actor is portraying an autistic individual. Members of the autism community have expressed their disappointment in an autistic actor not being hired for the role, likening this to Eddie Redmayne playing a trans woman in the film The Danish Girl, in that one person from a different background cannot truly understand or represent another person's perspective as much as someone who is the same neurotype, race or sexuality, for example. 5. Autism equals antisocial. Autistic individuals were once perceived as preferring to be isolated, but in the majority of cases this is not true. 
Although social situations and both friendship development and maintenance may be harder to understand for autistic individuals, they still want close connections with family and friends. These connections may just look different. 6. Autism is linked to the MMR vaccine. Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who is no longer a doctor, published a case series in the Lancet Journal in 1998 with his gastroenterology friends linking the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine to a risk of developing autism. It was suggested the MMR vaccine led to intestinal inflammation, causing the translocation of a usually non-permeable peptide to the brain through the bloodstream, potentially leading to behavioural regression and developmental disorders. But investigations such as those conducted by journalist Brian Deere and other researchers exposed Wakefield's fraudulent work. Here is an incomplete list of reasons this research was terrible. 1. Participants were gained through selective sampling. You can bias results if you get to pick your participants. 2. A lot of the data was parental observations. Participating parents were anti-MMR campaigners. 3. Data was removed, unreported, changed or falsified to suit the argument. 4. All the children were described as previously normal, despite five of them having documented pre-existing developmental concerns. 5. The sample size was 12, which is far too small, reducing the power of the study and increasing the margin for error. 6. There wasn't a control group, so they had nothing to compare results to. 7. The idea was that the MMR vaccine caused inflammation, but they didn't find inflammation in 9 out of 12 of the participants. 8. The moving peptide was never identified. 9. Some practices which didn't gain ethical clearance were conducted anyway. And 10. Wakefield was working on his own measles vaccination to sell as a safe alternative to an MMR vaccine. A retraction was published by 10 of the 12 co-authors in 2004, stating that there was no causal link established between the MMR vaccine and autism due to insufficient data. The paper was completely retracted from the Lancet in 2010, and Wakefield was removed from the medical register. Results have never been replicated. No research has ever shown the MMR vaccine is linked to autism. This chapter taken from Autism's History shows the widespread consequences of bad research and fake news. Despite the link being completely debunked, we're still talking about it and seeing its repercussions to this day. Obviously, the anti-vaccine movement would still probably exist without this study, and an increase in measles and reduction in vaccinations cannot be due to a single variable, but it has dangerously contributed falsities to the anti-vaccine rhetoric and lends support to another incorrect belief about autism, that 7. Autism was rare and now is common. Leo Kanner in the 1940s believed that his syndrome was incredibly rare and actively discouraged diagnosis, boasting that he turned away 9 out of the 10 children referred to him because they didn't meet the specific criteria he'd set out. Autism only gained a diagnostic category of its own in the 1980s, and later in that decade, Lorna Wing widened the scope of the autistic criteria with her concept of the autism spectrum. Since then, we have gained increased understanding of autism presentation in anyone not male, straight and white. The numbers of autism diagnoses, therefore, have naturally risen to meet the true number of autistic people in the population. Diagnostic criteria is wider, and a diagnosis itself is more accessible for more people. Autism has always been around, but we are only now starting to acknowledge it. 8. Autism equals no empathy. Another stereotype perpetuated by the media is that of the autistic, cold, unemotional character who cannot understand what another person is feeling or experiencing. Take Sherlock, for example. Papers written by non-autistic researchers often describes autistic individuals in a negative way, as lacking something, missing qualities, unable, reinforcing the idea that the majority, the non-autistic people, were the norm, and that anything else is less than. Judy Singer changed this idea in the 1990s, introducing the concept of neurodiversity, in which individuals with a different neurobiology were not lacking, but simply different. The social disability model of the 2000s suggests that the individual is disabled by their environment, society and perceptions of them, reframing society as problematic, not the individual. A paper by Rogers et al. argues that there are two types of empathy – Maybe autistic people's skills in cognitive empathy, the understanding of perspectives, isn't as sharp, but that doesn't mean that effective empathy, the ability to feel and share an emotional experience, to feel distress and compassion for others, is any different. Dr. Damien Milton went on to describe the double empathy problem, in which individuals from different backgrounds had different ways of expressing empathy. 
that empathy for different people simply looked different rather than not existing. It is only recently that research has acknowledged that empathy requires reciprocacy and mutual understanding. 9. Autism equals learning difficulties. The diagnostic criteria for autism detail that autistic individuals have deficits in social communication and interaction, plus display repetitive and restricted patterns of behaviour. Under these categories, there is a variety of severities, with autistic individuals requiring different levels and types of support than others. Around 40% of autistic people have a learning disability, and up to 70% of autistic individuals have a co-occurring condition, such as OCD, ADHD or anxiety which in turn affects the level of support needed. Some individuals often label autistic individuals without learning difficulties as high functioning or having Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's syndrome was removed from the diagnostic manuals very recently and high functioning has never been an official term used. A lot of the members of the autistic community do not like the term high functioning. The idea that someone is high-functioning diminishes the difficulties that they may be facing, and calling someone low-functioning, as the natural opposite of this, diminishes their strengths and successes. Not only that, these terms also suggest that autism is a scale rather than a spectrum. Autism characteristics are not linear in nature. There's so much differentiation between autistic people and within autistic people depending on their experiences, depending on their day. To reflect this, the DSM-5 and the ICD-11, the most frequently used diagnostic manuals in the USA and UK respectively, now use the umbrella term of ASD. Thanks for watching.